Okay, good morning. Today we are going to talk about uh, actuator and sensors. Uh, the material I'm going to, to show is a little bit different with respect to the textbook, uh, especially for what the sensor are concerned, because they're a little bit enlarged what is uh, what was mm, supposing originally is uh, only industrial robotics and uh, actuator and sensor for industrial applications. Uh, we are going to talk a little bit about possible joint actuated systems and uh, servo motors uh, and then sensor. Here, this picture is uh, an uh, underwater hydraulic arm. Uh, you can uh, see here that you need some tubes in order to uh, fill the system with the motors uh, with the liquid at the given pressure. Okay, for any uh, actuating systems, we can uh, recognize some subsystems that uh, are common uh, independently from the specific kind of motors you are using. Uh, first, uh, you need a surge of uh, energy, then uh, an amplifier, the motor and the uh, transmission, the gear. And of course, you're going to lose some power in all these uh, transmissions. And transmissions uh, are uh, needed in robotics uh, in most of the uh, robotics design for uh, the specific requirements uh, of a robot. You usually require a low motion, low velocity, sorry, no motion, at large torques. However, servo motors uh, usually provide you with uh, exactly the opposite. Then you need a transmission, so a gear and a reducer, in order to fill, I mean, your requirements uh, with the availability of uh, the motors. And then you need to select what kind of specific motors or uh, joints actuator system to use for uh, uh, a robot. And you choose according to several, actually several uh, factors. One is uh, the power. Then what kind of motion you need, if it is a rotation, rotation, or a rotation translation, and where is the motor with respect to the joint? Actually, the position of the motor with respect to the joint is a critical design aspect. When you have a, uh, an articulated rigid body and an arm, your uh, dynamic requirements is, is to have uh, all most of the mass uh, close to the base. You don't want to, to bring around a large mass at the end of it. And this is uh, very easy from the intuitive aspect, even if you're not I mean, mechanical engineering. You want to, to bring, to, to keep, let me say, the masses and the motors uh, close to the base. Uh, you can see several uh, uh, robot design where a l large effort has been devoted by the designer in order to keep, for example, the three motors of the wrist uh, close to the elbow, okay? Main kind of transmissions are those represented here, and uh, you need to select them according to really the specific applications, the overall design of your robot. Uh, we are not going to you know, go really into the details of those because this is mostly related to the overall mechanical design of the robot. But we need to interpret them uh, from the dynamic aspect because they do affect the dynamic properties of the robot. And as our controller needs to properly take into account also those aspects, okay? Uh, for example, the gears, uh, as this one, uh, they do exhibit uh, as properties, for example, the, a change in the axis of, uh, of uh, rotation and the translation of the application point, okay, for example. Uh, if you have uh, a belt here, you can uh, um, observe from the, di from the um, dynamic aspect that this 
can introduce some flexibility in the transmission due to the property of the material that is used to make the transmission, of course. Another possibility is the chain, as in any bike. Chain can, be, uh, can suffer from, for example, um, vibrations. Okay, so every kind of transmission has its pro and con, and we will see the dynamic effect of the, uh, of the gear in a um, dynamic model of the robot. We are going to study the dynamics starting next Wednesday. So the dynamics uh, means you know, force equal mass by acceleration. Next Wednesday and the transmission will play a certain role in this in this those equations. Uh, here I've just taken a picture from a commercial. Okay, from technical specifications, but this was really commercial. Uh, let us see, this is a washing machine. Okay, let us see the way they do present uh, the fact that their motor is without transmission. Okay, so, uh, sorry, so the motor is directly attracted to the drum and this gives us benefit uh, less noise and vibration. Of course, noise is important for a washing machine. It is in a domestic environment, but also in an industrial environment. Noise uh, is an important factor. And then uh, another uh, um, consideration to be done is the eventual loss of energy. Without transmission, you don't have uh, the loss of energy given by the transmission by itself. Okay? On the other hand, if your washing machine is driven with a um, transmission, you can have noise no, and vibration. Less stable balancing system is a little bit generic, this sentence, but this can give uh, vibration. Now, this sentence, uh, dynamics no more the couplet, implies more sophisticated control, is something that uh, uh, we didn't uh, approach yet. We will understand it later on, okay? The fact that with uh, a transmission, uh, with a certain uh, ratio uh, of uh, uh, reduction, you can somehow decouple the dynamics. And we, we will understand it uh, later on. This is an example of uh, uh, Another possible, another possible um, gear, the strain wave gear, and it's the one that is mounted uh, on the uh, lightweight uh, and uh, Yako that we have in the lab. I'll just show you very briefly a commercial, as usual. I mean, they, they make very nice and informative, <laughs> informative videos, short videos, in order to appreciate the way it works and the movement it does. Mm. We just see now the relative movement. You will understand the way it works. This is a lipsoidal.
this video shows the movement. You avoid backlash. Okay, this compact is every every everything is is just very um, yes compact. You can have a large ratio. The end here is a, is a, a mistake. Good resolution, repeatability, and uh, another asp important aspect uh, is the lure torque that it can um, support. And input output are coaxial, for example. What is the backlash? The backlash is a common problem uh, in all uh, the gears, and is given by uh, let me say the uh, space that you need in order to implement, I mean, the, the relative motion, and that is the loss, let me, let me say, when you invert the motor rotation. And the backlash uh, can be something like uh, dot one uh, degree, okay? And from the input output relation, uh, you do have this nonlinear relationship between the a joint, the motor position and the joint position. Okay, <coughs> servo motors, uh, we basically have uh, three big families of uh, servo motors. Uh, they can be uh, divided in uh, pneumatic motors, hydraulic and electrical. Uh, Pneumatic and hydraulic, uh, they work according to more or less a similar principle. You do need some, uh, uh, you know, compressed uh, fluid that can be here uh, hair, for example, or uh, a liquid, uh, water typically, or electrical motors, they are most, the, the, the most diffused in the, in the, uh, in the market. Uh, let me just show you another commercial about uh, a pneumatic motor by a company, German company, that shows quite clearly the functioning methods of this kind of actuators. And also some kind of uh, graphical user in interface, but now, okay. We have some PLC here that need to be to control the motors and uh, one of the drawbacks and uh, you physically need to, uh, to send, to bring the compressed fluid uh, into the motor. So you need some wires. And this is uh, of course a drawback that you don't have with electrical motors. And here you can appreciate the way it is, uh, the motion is achieved, okay? you feel with compressed fuel fluid and you can have actually here you can have a interesting property of the motors that we will study when we are going to do interaction control and the name is impedance we will understand it later on this is something that can be achieved with this kind of, of motors Okay. The most diffused motors in uh, robotics are this one. I think you don't you, you don't have in your career any more uh, electrical machine, right? Because you are co for co from computer science. Uh, here it should be the exam of azionamenti electric. You don't have it. So we are going just to see the main property of uh, main properties of this kind of motors, but of course without going into the details. Uh, what the characteristics are, okay, we, we want a small inertia and a large power weight ratio. Uh, small inertia, why? Well, we, we want it to be light, okay? And we will understand it when we are going to study the dynamics of the motor, but it's, it's clearly uh, intuitive, from the, from the intuitive aspect, uh, it's clear that you want, we want a small motor able to provide a large power. So the power weight ratio is an important factor when you buy, typically when you buy a motor, you don't, you don't design it, you buy in order to 
to build, uh, let me say, a new robot. Uh, you want your motor to be able to uh, provide you impulsive torques. Uh, if you want to, 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 to implement uh, a very uh, fast movement, it means that you want high accelerations in a short time. It means uh, impulsive torque from, I mean, the requirements of your motor. Your motor should be able to provide the impulsive torque. And uh, the possibility to overload. Uh, large acceleration is similar. Your motor should be able to provide you a large range of velocity. The velocity can be really arranged with three order of magnitudes of difference. And of course, uh, a certain accuracy, okay? Uh, at least 10 minus three of uh, uh, degrees. No, minus five. Okay, and this is, I mean, this is achieved by buying servo motors on the, on the market. Uh, you can do trajectory following, position regulation, and you can select between uh, among various kind of electrical servo motors, so as uh, DC or brushless step motors, and uh, hydraulic servo motors. Uh, you haven't done those uh, in, in your career, so we, we are going to be quite fast here. Uh, what are the pro and cons of the electrical uh, servo motors? Uh, very easily. No, power supply is almost everywhere, so we can easily just plug our, our motor, our robot. Uh, the market uh, is mostly dominated by this kind of motors, it means that uh, they are cheap and you can find, I mean, a really wide range of products. Uh, high power, easy maintenance, uh, and uh, I mean, that the working environment is not affected by the presence of an electrical servo motors. Uh, cons, well, cons, uh, the, the static configuration needs uh, to be uh, counteracted, so you need to provide uh, a constant torque at uh, zero velocity, and you can, have, you, can, you can observe burnout problems. And of course, you cannot use easily in a flammable environment. With hydraulic servo motors, you don't have any problem of burnout because you have uh, the fluid as a certain pr pressure and you just you know, close the valve, so no problem of burnout. Uh, the fluid that circulates also helps from the head point of view, and so they're also self-lubricated. Uh, they don't have a problem in a flammable environment, and uh, they are much better with respect to the electrical one for what the power to weight is concerned, okay? However, there are several uh, uh, negative aspects of hydraulic servo motors. You need uh, an hydraulic power station, okay? So you need uh, somewhere where the liquid is. Uh, it's very difficult to miniaturize and the costs are high for, actually for economical reasons because the market is much, is much smaller. Uh, you lose much more power with respect to electrical one. You need maintenance uh, and uh, you may need to have a fluid such as oil inside uh, and uh, can uh, encounter pro problem of uh, oil leakage. Actually, the hydraulic servo motors, servo motors are uh, used uh, almost, I mean, they almost dominate the underwater uh, market. The dynamic behaviors of the electrical servo motors uh, is uh, very good from the control aspect, and uh, I mean, they are very efficient, very good when you need to implement any, any controller. Uh, the hydraulic servo motors uh, are a little bit more difficult to control and uh, the dynamics uh, is function of the temperature. We are not going to study the, the dynamics of uh, hydraulic servo motors and when we are going to study the dynamics, we will assume an electrical servo motor, okay? Okay, let me skip all the power amplifier parts, okay? 
I think you don't have any in, in your background of these concepts. Uh, we need to amplify the power to modulate, but I mean, it's something that we, we can uh, survive without. Okay, here I'm, I'm just going to show you uh, the equations uh, of uh, the um, motion of the motor. Again, we are not going to go into the details of those equations, but I mean, I like to show you that what we have done uh, in the first class of uh, uh, control is actually, I mean, it, it, does, it does exist in the real life. The difference is that here is a little bit more complicated uh, and you have some nonlinear blocks such as the saturation here, for example. When you write uh, the equations of motion for an electrical motor, you do have usually two kinds of equations. First, you have the dynamics um, of uh, the electrical part that provide uh, the, the alimentation to the motor. The, and uh, here the A is from the uh, armatura. And the effect of the motor is uh, uh, a tension that is proportional to the angular velocity of uh, the motor. And then you have uh, the mechanical equations, the mechanical balance. Uh, we are going to study the dynamics later on, but basically here we are going to implement uh, the second law of dynamics, forces equal mass by acceleration where here the rotational motion means that we have torques and not linear force. And uh, the um, uh, interaction between the electrical and mechanical part is given for the mechanical balance by the fact that the torques is proportional to the current that circulates in the electrical part, okay, by a certain constant. Uh, and we have a certain power amplifier. So those are the equations. What is very uh, nice is that those equations are linear. We write down the equations and we can implement a controller for it. Okay? We can have two kind of, basically two kind of, of controller, the so-called velocity control generator. We skip all the details, but in the end, we do have uh, a proportionality between the tension and the angular velocity of the motor. The angular velocity of the motor that by means of the gear ratio is actually the joint velocity. So we are able to control the joint velocity with the electrical motors by the use of a very simple first, a very simple controller, okay? Then we can have some, uh, you know, more elaborated uh, um, block diagrams. For example, here we have a current protection. It's a nonlinear introduction. We are not going to, to study. And a second possible um, controller design actually gives you a torque controller generator. So you have a proportionality between the tension and the torque of the motor. Not the velocity, but the torque. And you can use them in a different way. So again, not going to go into the details, it's just to show you that what you have done in, what was the, nom uh, the name when you made the exam? Fondamenti di Sistemi Dinamici? Si? Okay. For the hydraulic drives, uh, you can make a similar reasoning and you can uh, implement a design and implement uh, a controller. And the equations are more or less are linear. As I told you, they change with the temperature of the fluid, but here if you assume it constant, you can design a controller. Okay, let me spend a couple of words on the effect of uh, the transmission and the, the, the gear reduction. Okay, so that's... Uh, we touch with our hands in a very simple uh, situation. The, the, the inverted pendulum, uh, the pendulum is, uh, let me say, the, the, the basic uh, robot that we, we can imagine. The planar two link is uh, another, I mean, basic uh, uh, model, but this is really you know, one step below the planar two link. 
Uh, here we have uh, the motor uh, with a certain inertia, a certain torques, CM, the motor position uh, as the uh, lower scale M. Uh, this graphical representation uh, is needed in order to represent the friction. Okay, so here, Fm is the friction. Then we have the transmission with a certain uh, reduction. The order of magnitude of the reduction is between uh, 10 and uh, 500. And then we have our link. The theta here is uh, the joint position. It's the same variable that we use for the Denat Hartman conversion in order to represent the joint position. Uh, our uh, our uh, uh, link is characterized by certain inertia and a certain center of mass. Okay, we are going to study dynamics next lesson, but now we are going to use very basic uh, concept coming from physics. Now, the reduction of the gear is uh, uh, equally represented by any of those three relationships. Is the ratio between the radiuses for this kind of gear, okay? And it is equal to the ratio between the joint position and the motor position and between the velocities, motor and link velocity. This is also the reason why we can say that uh, one side of uh, the gear is the fast side and the other is the slow side because there is a, a factor of KR. It's the same as in your bike, okay? When you use uh, the, the, the gear, what you do is actually to change this factor. Okay. So the, if we are talking about, for example, 100 reduction, it means that on the link side, you have a velocity that is smaller of a factor 100 with respect to the motor one. Okay, the, the motor is always the fastest part of your uh, actuation system. Okay, so what is the effect, for example, on the gravity? Let us see. Uh, the second law of dynamics says that, uh, okay, force is equal mass by acceleration. Now we have a rotational motion. So the torque, uh, actuating torque, is equal, mass by acceleration is the inertia multiplied by the angular acceleration, plus we do have uh, the non-conservative forces. Here we have uh, the uh, friction. This is the viscous friction. We are going to ignore most of the time the static friction. We are going to talk uh, next week about the details of the dynamics, but we are going to now currently to consider only the linear terms, the simplest one, so viscous friction, plus, well, this is the, the, the torque that is coming from the link, okay? Since my motor is in connection with the link by the way of the gear, this is coming from the gear. And uh, it's given by the force exchanged between the link and the motor multiplied by the radius of the gear, okay? And this is the equation of motion for the motor. Now, the equation of motion for the link is given by, well, we have uh, the actuating torque. Now, the, the actuation comes from the motor. So the torques provided by the motor is actually what is moving my link, okay? And F is the same, but R is changing. So now we can appreciate that the price that, that we paid in, the, in, in, in having a high velocity at the motor side and a slow velocity at the link side now is uh, counteracted by the fact that the torques that they change is different. Okay, here we have a large torque at small velocity. In the motor, we have a high velocity and low torque. Equal, and this is what you do with your bike, okay? When you change the gear, you change and uh, you, you, you make a compromise between those two uh, characteristics of 
the power transmission from your legs to the bike. So this is equal, again, mass by acceleration, viscous friction, and then we have an additional torque uh, with the uh, subscript L. It means load, whatever it means is load, okay? So if I just push on the, on the link, I'm the load. I'm providing a force by load. But this can be also, for example, the gravity, okay? Okay, let us put together those two equations and uh, because the F is the same, okay? So we can uh, substitute F from the second to the third, to the first. And without making the computation, because they're really, really trivial, we can uh, observe that omega is equal, is related to the motor velocity by kR. And the same is for omega dot. So here we can rewrite all as function of motor angular velocity and motor angular acceleration. And this is what I see. And it's very interesting because the, gravi the, the inertia that is seen at by, by the motor is given by the inertia of the motor that is more by construction. We, we select motor with a, a build motor with a small inertia. So this is a small number plus well, the inertia of the link, that is, what is it? It depends from my, my arm, it depends from my robot, is uh, divided by a factor kR squared. It means that if I have a gear ratio of 100, the inertia of the link is uh, 10,000 smaller at the motor side. This is very convenient because it means that the motor sees a much small, as much lighter, let me say, link. And the same, you uh, are happy with your bike and uh, <coughs> you see a gravity that is much smaller, okay? When you use uh, in a high gear ratio with your bike. The same for the friction divided by the square of the gear ratio. And actually the load is only divided by the gear ratio, not square. If you make the computations, it's, it's easy to see that this is divided by kR. For example, your gravity is divided by this factor, for example, 100, okay? Now, the concept uh, that the dynamics tends to be linearized. Now linearized is written in italic because we don't have yet all the information to, to, to fully understand what does it mean, okay? But we can start a little bit understanding. The gravity is function of, of theta, is function of the angle for a pendulum, okay? If I divide it by 100, of course I don't change the dependency from the mathematical aspect because KR here is constant. But I change its effect from the uh, absolute value. It's divided by 100, okay? So it means that I feel the gravity divided by 100. I, I tend to don't feel the gravity. So I'm linearizing the system because this is clearly a nonlinear term, even for a simple pendulum, okay? A simple, a simple pendulum with simply one joint and the only nonlinearity comes from the sinus of the gravity, I tend to linearize. And if my system is linear, I do have a, a huge uh, control theory that I can use to design controller. If it's not linear, well, we are going to study some controllers in the, in the, in the remaining part of the, of the class. Okay. Uh, let me... 
Let me continue without break today, because it's a really, I would say, an easy lesson, and we are going to talk about the sensors now. That are crucial, the selection and the use of the sensor is crucially, especially for the advanced robotics applications. We are going to see also some sensor use for car, um, autonomous car applications. We divide the sensor in propositive and exteroceptive sensor. The proprioceptive sensor are the sensor that measure something internal to the robot. Exteroceptive, something that measure the relation of the robot with the environment or the environment itself. Okay. We will understand clearly that in order to have uh, a proper perception of the robot and the relation of the robot with the environment, it is really critical to implement sensor fusion techniques. And this will be really clear uh, later on when I'll show you some applications. Really you cannot imagine to have one sensor that measure any variable that you need. Sometimes this is physically simply impossible. What you are going to do is use several sensors that measure several aspects of your system, and then you are going to fuse them. Well, this is exactly what we have done with the state estimate filters, nonlinear Kalman filter, because nonlinear, everything is nonlinear, but with state estimate filters are exactly what is needed in order to fuse sensors together, not only for robotic applications, but also in robotic applications. Okay, a little bit of terminology when we use a, a sensor, we talk about resolution precision, repeatability, and accuracy, okay? And here we have a graphical representation of those concepts. The <coughs> uh, repeatability is just related to how your measurement uh, clusterized together, okay? So the, the good repeatability simply means that you measure always the same, but not necessarily that this is a correct value. Then uh, the <coughs> uh, accuracy is uh, uh, related uh, to, let me say, the, the division around uh, a, certain, uh, a certain value. And of course, what you require to use your sensor is both good accuracy and good repeatability, means that uh, your measurement clusterize around the real value, okay? Okay, first of all, let us start from the bottom. What do we do need to measure is uh, the motor position, okay? If the motor is linear, we have uh, several sensors that allows us to, 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 to measure for example, potentiometers or similar, if it's angular, again, potentiometer, but encoder. We, we do have uh, encoders uh, mounted on the, on the motors. They are very cheap and very efficient sensors. Those are two different implementations for the encoders. One is absolute and the other is incremental. What is the difference? If you look at the left-hand side, the absolute encoder, uh, you have uh, several sectors, and if you have uh, uh, four here, for example, four LEDs here, and uh, photo-sensitive um, element here, you see that the numbers are coded as a binary representation. Whenever you are, you can exactly read the sector concerned. Now we have four levels and 16 sectors. The right hand side, on the other end, only has three levels. 
And if you just put your photosensitive elements everywhere, you can see simply 0, 1 for the first, for the second, and then you look, the third is all white except for one single sect. So let's see what is the information that you can read from the red that, uh, right hand side. You can read uh, simply the transition from one sector to the other. If you imagine you are here, white, white, and then uh, the motor rotates and you go, no, you go, the photosensitive remain uh, fixed. And, uh, and then coder gives you white, black, you know that you made one transition on the clockwise direction. If you read black, white, you made the counterclockwise direction. So you can count how many transitions, and you can count how many transitions for a given, for example, uh, amount of time. It means that you are measuring the velocity. You integrate that, and you have the position. This is the only situation where the integral of the velocity gives you the position, because if you assume those are discrete measurements, if you assume that you are not going to lose any transition, well, you are just counting, so it's okay. The role of the internal level here, the ring with all white but just one black sector, is to give you the zero, because when you turn on your joint, you, your motor, sorry, well, you don't know where you are. You just rotate it and tell you until you find this sector and this gives you the zero. Of course, the difference is that the incremental encoder is much cheaper than the absolute one, okay? Okay, here there is a resolver that is another kind of trans a transducer that gives you the, the, the position. Then you can measure the velocity. Usually, in, uh, in industrial robot, uh, you make the, numer the numerical uh, time derivative of the position. If your uh, encoder is, uh, has a good resolution, you can make the numerical derivative. It's good enough. We know that when you, we make the derivatives, we are uh, amplifying the noise measurement. So this should be made a little bit with curve, but in, 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 uh, in our applications, this can be done more or less without too many uh, problems. For the acceleration, no. If you make twice the derivative, the incremental derivatives, the acceleration is just noise. Unless you make some low-pass filter. But low-pass low filter introduces time delay, and time delay is des destabilizing. So always compromise. Okay? We always need to to find compromise. Okay, fourth sensors. Uh, did you make electrical measurement? Yes. Okay, so maybe you saw this one, uh, so the, the strain gauge. Again, we are not going to, to go into the details, but uh, yes, we can measure force moment by using a strain gauge. You have some resistance here, and if you, are, if you apply a force, you affect the value of the resistance and with proper measurement of the voltages, you can you know, ex estimate force and moment that is, um, that is uh, insisting on your sense, okay? Here, for example, the, there is a, a Force, uh, uh, sorry, there is a torque sensor that is embedded in the motor. Uh, this draw is taken by the lightweight, the KUKA lightweight, but the design is equal to the one that we have in the lab manufactured by uh, Kinova. And they have uh, uh, here everything, the electronics, the gear ratio, and the torque sensor. The torque sensor is mounted uh, after the gear ratio, so below it. It means that you are measuring the 
torque at the link level, not at the motor level. Okay? If you have the information, you can, since there is only a linear relationship, ignoring the flexibility. Okay, let us assume that we ignore the uh, flexibility. Uh, this is a very nice design and uh, it really uh, changed a lot the industrial robotics market. Uh, it was first uh, a, a project by a German uh, institute, uh, DLR in Munich, and they came out with this design of the lightweight. Uh, I, we saw a couple of pictures. Uh, the advantage of this one is really given by the overall dimension of the robot, by the possibility of uh, implement advanced control <coughs> systems that we will see a little bit uh, later. And thus they open the possibility to have a more safe robot uh, and the possibility for an operator to share the workspace with a robot. We will discuss this uh, later on, but we already I mean, saw in our lab that the robots are there without any specific safety system. With the industrial one, you need to have a physical separation of the operator with respect to the robot. For example, with the electrified doors. You open the door and you turn off the power to the motor. You don't need any more with the lightweight robot because of some dynamic characteristics that we will understand later on, okay? And also uh, characteristic of the uh, control. Now, the risk force sensor, here we, we, I just reported the, the families of sensors sold by a specific company, just to show you the dimension of uh, the, the, the sensors. The dimension means uh, typically uh, the maximum force moment that you can measure. Okay, and where you are going to measure, what is the maximum one, and then, of course, you need also to, 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 to see the technical specification for the signal-to-noise ratio for the frequency of acquisition. Typically, those are the characteristics. And then, for example, how do I connect with the, with the, the sensor? Is a cable with the Ethernet? Uh, maybe there is a Wi-Fi module or something like that. Uh, well, uh, look at this uh, picture. Here we have the robot flange. The flange means the last mechanical part where you screw your tool. Okay? But in the middle between the tool and the flange, you have the sensor. But we should pay a little bit attention here because this is where the robot is exchanging force with the object. Okay? But this is the place where I'm measuring the forces. I need uh, to properly convert my measurement with the relationship we studied uh, last lesson in statics. So how do I uh, um, transform force moment from one place to the other of if they're both rigidly connected to the same rigid body? So here, both the point here and the point here are on the same rigid body. I'm making the measurement here, but I'm exchanging the force moment here, okay? So basically I need to make this, the, the but well, basically not, there is an additional problem. I, I need to know exactly the point here where I'm exchanging the forces, okay? And it could be or not trivial, depending on the application. And here, this is the relationship that we studied uh, last uh, Wednesday. Forces are just rotated. Moments needs also to consider for the moment, com moment contribution of the linear force. And rotation, every, everything is, uh, is uh, expressed in its own frame. I need to rotate to have it in the proper frame. Okay, this is specific, uh, a specific uh, uh, implementation we are going to skip. 
This is another uh, fourth sensor. It's optic based. It's just to show you that there is a wide availability of sensors depending on the application. And I saw this kind of sensor in a, in a further, very, very sensitive, very nice. Uh, if you just, uh, if you just uh, slide your finger on the surface, it, it, it really reads very, very fine forces. Okay? What are the limits of this? Well, for example, I'm measuring only the forces in, in a same sphere, so not from the other, let me say, direction. And then the maximum force can be limited because here I have a sensitive surface, a reflective uh, layer. Here there is a light emitter and uh, a photosensitive element. So I'm uh, measuring the uh, deformation of the surface. The limits are given by I mean, the maximum deflection that I can impose before breaking everything, for example. Okay? Vision sensors. Vision is a very diffuse and cheap sensor. It's very light. You need uh, a uh, low amount of energy to, to power it. And gives you a lot of information. Unfortunately, we are not very good uh, in understanding what kind of information is giving us a, a vision not very good means that uh, it's very difficult to understand a scene from a video streaming, for example. Okay? Uh, first of all, you have your uh, vision. The first approach that you can have is to have uh, a geometric approach. So, geometric approach means, okay, uh, I know the way a point in 3D is projected into the two-dimensional pixel matrix. I make my uh, calibration, my, uh, my uh, identification, and uh, I extract geometric information from the environment. We are not going to do it, but this is the first done is done when you, you buy a camera. You calibrate the camera, okay? There are some tools that make it automatically, but you should know what kind of mistakes you can, you can make, for example. So you are, we are not going to do it in this class, but in the lab it's something that is really, is really needed. Uh, analog, there are different standards and so on, but okay, let me go into the, here, into the possible implementation of the, of the video. You basically have two kinds of approaches, uh, or a mix of both, low level and high level. Low level means I uh, look at the geometric aspect of what I'm looking. Geometric aspect means I try to recognize centroids, intensity of light, eventual discontinuity. Let, let us consider we have an industrial um, uh, environment. Industrial environment with a, a, a belt, with a camera mounted on it, structure the light without windows, so the light is always the same, with the same component. The object that comes are uh, more or less the same, coming from the same application. It's very easy and very fast to recognize the object, the position on the plane, for in 2D plane, and to give the command to the robot to, to pick up the object. There are some commercial software, some uh, high-speed uh, um, video system, and it's very, it's very, uh, it's a common operation. Okay. Uh, now, let us consider, for example, this this uh, uh, snapshot, and I, I have a, a small video taken in our lab later on. Here we have uh, a guy and uh, a. Um, automatic system that needs to recognize uh, several objects in the environment. It has been learned, it's a learning system, neural network, deep or not, it doesn't matter, and it has been learned uh, recognizing an object with respect to the set very small here. I recognize one, two, three, four, five, six, seven objects, okay? I, I, I don't care what specific objects are, bottle, mouse, uh, glove, mug, okay? 
but I just want to focus the attention that here the head of the operator is recognized with a high probability as a cell phone. Okay. Uh, let us see. In our lab, we just downloaded uh, a trained library for detection of, uh, of uh, uh, object in a domestic environment. So specific library for object. We can see that it's quite nice. I just talked casually. Dining table, cup, bottle, bottle. One chair is good, the other chair is more or less good because it's in the four legs of a table. But it's okay, I mean, it's an object that can be a chair. Sometimes it doesn't see the same object that he saw in the frame, in the previous frame, okay? But we can be more or less happy with that. Well, poster is not a TV monitor, but okay. However, this is a screenshot of uh, uh, a test that they have done in our in our lab. Now. The library is recognizing the object within the script. Okay, fine, that's nice. Cup, okay. Cup, okay. Bottle, okay. This is a joystick. Bottle, okay. Chair, 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 chair. Okay, there is none. Book, book. I don't see any book. TV monitor, I really don't know what's seen. And here, can you read here? So, uh, we can rely on uh, a high level of, uh, of um, um, software you know, that makes interpretation of the object, and most of the time uh, they are correct, but uh, we cannot just leave our robot without any kind of uh, further interpretation, without a feedback, because here is making a lot of mistake, and then from frame to frame is going to lose the same object that you saw the previous one. This is easy to handle because we just need a filter. Because if I'm if I have a, a measurement then I miss and then I, I have another one, if I put a filter inside, in the middle one is going to use you know the, the previous one because we are using always the alternation between model and measurement as we, we I mean we studied in a, in a state estimate uh, but if the error is persistent well this is something that is very difficult to find and this is one possible master thesis in our in our lab uh, multimodal perception multimodal means okay I don't trust only the camera. I use RGBD, for example. Yes, it's another camera, but I have another information that is the depth. Or I can have marker with infrared uh, cameras in a structured environment. Of course, I cannot have marker in the street, but if I want to have uh, in a uh, system that is designed to, 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 to help disabled people, I can imagine to have some uh, infrared camera in this room, for example. And you can imagine to have some marker in the wheelchair, for example. Okay, so I can fuse sensor coming from, uh, information coming from several sensors. Okay. This is another possible sensor, laser range finder. We do have it uh, in several of our uh, robots, mobile robots. The mobile robots move on a plane, okay? So this plot is very informative and is also very easy. I'm on a flat terrain. I move uh, on 2D. My uh, laser gem finder gives information about, uh, if, if I don't remember well, it was 270 degrees. 
700 readings every, uh, every 100 milliseconds. Okay, so 10 hertz. And I'm reading, I mean, a any kind of ossavol I may encounter. Um, flat surface, it's more or less easy. We also mounted on the quad rotor. And so in the quad rotor, you have additional you know, mobility of your system, and you need to make a uh, you know, state estimate. But it's nice. What are the problems with the laser range finder? Well, laser. I need to, to read the, I need to read when the signal comes back. And there are situations where it, it doesn't. We have problem with the windows, we have problem with the, with the mirror, okay? Yeah, this is the same, 270, but the, re the resolution, okay. We have three readings for each degree, and, but overlapping a little bit, okay? Okay, radar mounted uh, typically on uh, vehicles. What is the, the, the working principle? Radio waves, okay? And uh, in, the, in the microwaves domain. Uh, nicely sees through the fog. Your camera wouldn't give you enough information. Give you, it detects because with, with a certain error position and velocity of the other vehicles. Very poor resolution. And, uh, I mean, a huge uh, drawback confuses static environmental object as the ground with a static car. It means that uh, you can uh, wrongly assume that you are uh, going to eat a car in front of you if there is something a little bit on the side because it's a pure resolution and makes this confusing. Okay? LIDAR. LIDAR measures the time of flight and uh, is a, li a laser range finder. The name is different because uh, a little bit of the, of, the, of the design but the physics is the same as the laser. Okay? Uh, very nicely I'm, I'm not affected by night day clouds, but I'm affected by heavy rain, snow, and fog. Okay? Uh, nicely reject interferences. It, it, the, the, um, the beam is, is smaller with respect to the radar. The laser is, is really direction, the radar is a bit less. This sentence is uh, uh, outdated. No, the, the more and more that I, I, I have these slides, it's always up to date because it started from costing 100 kilo euros one LiDAR system. The forecast is that is, uh, it will decrease and uh, when and if it's going to be something like 100, this will be mounted uh, on uh, less automatic car. We don't have automatic car yet, but it, it will be mounted in, in, in a much more uh, applications than uh, today. Uh, the first Google car, uh, the uh, LiDAR, the, the sensors, all the sensors, costed uh, half of the price of the Google car. Okay? The range is good, 70 meters, but I mean, the, the, the space that you need to stop your car is, is, can be more than 70 meters, depending on the, on the speed. Okay. Sensor fusion, in an automatic car, you do have a lot of sensors all together. For example, those are radars, video camera, LiDAR on the top, GPS to measure your position, another radar on the back, ultrasonic on the, on the wheel. Uh, okay, this is just a computer. Uh, again, here we do have uh, a nice plot when sees the overlapping fields of camera, radar, and LiDAR, okay? And the, the, the eventual problems. If you want to read the why uh, automatic car are not really, seems to be not really 
not so close as it seems from the, from the newspaper, ever read this article. Uh, when I was a student, I remember that newspaper says we will have automatic car or electrical vehicles, in, electrical and automated in five years. Uh, I have now white bird and uh, we don't have yet automatic car. Okay, here is a nice, this guy is, is really, uh, is a professor at MIT. And uh, it is really, uh, it's really uh, loose, lucid and, and focused on, on uh, it makes very nice blocks that are popular. You can read it, uh, you can read it uh, without uh, uh, being necessarily an expert in robotics. Have a look at it because it's very, very interesting. Okay, RGBD, first starting with uh, Microsoft Kinect. So the first time that we saw as a community robotics this sensor was when it entered the market for the video games. Okay. Uh, RGBD gives you RGB as a normal vision system plus the distance, okay? Cloud points, you give you in 3D uh, a cloud of all the points that you are encountering. Nice sensor, we use it and uh, it's quite useful in, in, in a lab, in a small environment. Then some advanced systems, for example, underwater. You need a lot of sensors. We did uh, uh, the project for Teoriadi Sistemi. I don't know if it was your uh, year, yes or not. What kind of a project you did? Or you, you already forgot? <laughs> when when do, did you do the exam? In February, and you forgot the, the project that. Uh, okay. Controller of server for what? Um, ah, okay, okay. Must prefer the car. Okay. Uh, the year previous, so last year, we use uh, the project, uh, but, but I use those data for the, for the theory. So you have the localization of the underwater vehicles in the theory in one lesson of Kalman Fitri yeah. this year. Okay, so sensor fusion, you already had the application, so let me be a little bit faster. We do have uh, a lot of sensors here, uh, all needed in order to simply localize the, ro the, the, the rigid body, okay? An object underwater. You need a lot of sensors to do it. We did it, so let me be a little bit more fast here. Uh, this is just uh, an uh, OV open it, and uh, you can see here INS, Inertial Navigation System, USBL and Acoustic Mode. And USBL is an acoustic uh, uh, GPS, let me say, uh, in, in one word, and acoustic is also used for communication, and a little bit of other sensor needed for the mission uh, and not only for the localization. This is a Doppler velocity lock and gives you the velocity of the object with respect to the sea bottom. If you are far from the sea bottom, it gives you the velocity with respect to the water. Okay? And if you don't know if you are close or not to the sea bottom, this may be a problem. Okay. IMU. You measure angle with the, oh, you fuse the compass, angle with respect to the magnetic north. Okay? If you use a compass here, it's not, it will not work because the uh, magnetic field close to the um, buildings is affected by the metal present in the structure. So if, you're, if you developed a system for your autonomous robot that used compass is not going to work uh, to work within inside the building and also the magnetic field uh, is uh, terrestrial magnetic field uh, can exhibit 
no, can exhibit a lot of local deformations, even far away from the uh, man-made structure. Then you measure angular velocities, linear accelerations, and, peel and uh, pitch and roll. Pitch and roll is fine because pitch and roll uh, are measured by um, means of the uh, gravity. The gravity, I mean, we can assume that for our applications the gravity stays constant all over the globe, but the compass is a little bit problematic. You need to always integrate and fuse all kinds of sensors, okay? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm you are also, you can find it on the market uh, with the name inertial navigation system and you embed in a, in a microcontroller a sensor fusion system. So you can embed something and you can use additional information. Underwater, for example, uh, one sensor that is very reliable is the pressure sensor because the pressure is one atmosphere at the surface and one atmosphere every 10 meters, and more or less is really, I mean, constant, the physics is constant, the sensor is cheap, and uh, is signal to noise ratio is very good, so always use it, don't, don't uh, avoid it. Okay, and then, the end, you need to implement, you need, you may want to implement simultaneous localization mapping algorithms with all the sense that we saw today. Okay, we stop here.